I invite you all to look at these two images. How do we feel as we look at them? Are we comfortable? Do we want to keep looking? Do we wish for her recovery? Would we feel more comfortable knowing that these are pictures of me? And since I'm up here right now, talking to you with a functioning and barely scarred face, everything is okay. This phenomenon of discomfort in the face of disability is defined by theorists David Mitchell and Shannon Snyder as narrative prosthesis. In literature, we can observe how disability is usually remedied or ultimately removed from narrative. The character gets better, disappears, or dies. The old woman with Alzheimer's in the notebook can't remember, so she dies. Forrest Gump miraculously starts running against all odds, shedding his leg braces and his awkward limp. He's healed, and Jenny, the beautiful, enchanting woman he's loved for his whole life, can finally love him back. But once she falls ill with AIDS, a disability so taboo, it isn't even said out loud in the film. She dies too. Snow White finds her charming, able-bodied prince and leaves the seven disabled dwarves forever. We watch them in the film, wave goodbye to her, smiling, awkward, short, exiled, and voiceless. Because in this story, as with so many others, the disabled characters have no voice. We are not comfortable just sitting with disability. So my question is, what would that be like to just sit with disability, with otherness, with else, to explore it? I took these pictures after experiencing tonic-clonic epileptic seizures. I wasn't sure why, but I felt compelled to document these moments before I was stitched up and fixed, before I was medicated and put to sleep before I returned back to the world with a full set of teeth. I now realize that I wanted to explore my epilepsy, not just put it back into hiding. What were my body and mind experiencing? How did I feel? How did I look? It might seem strange that I wanted to document my pain. And for a few years, I never even looked at the pictures, but I didn't delete them either. And as I run my tongue every so often over my now uneven fake teeth and apply lipstick in different ways to cover my reconstructed lip, I realize that apart from the pain and shame, I have other things to explore. Like even though I can no longer bite directly into an apple or a piece of Italian bread for fear of pulling out one of my fake teeth, I actually love the way my mouth feels. I no longer have this perfectly curated set of straight teeth forced into obedience by three years of ever tightening metal, pain, money and maintenance. Now, my mouth holds memories. And I don't just mean because I talk a lot, although I do. My teeth are uneven and a little bit cracked. My smile is lopsided, and I will never take a symmetrical selfie. But in these differences, my mouth feels so much more like mine. And I've also discovered that when the scar on my lip is stimulated, I feel strong sexual pleasure, and it's very nice. And I remember one of those nights that a doctor rushed over with a plastic surgeon and shined a bright light over my face, and both of their eyes grew really big behind their masks. And the plastic surgeon grabbed my hand and it felt like ice. And she said to me in what I think she meant to be a reassuring tone, don't worry, I am going to fix you up so fast, you will never remember that this even happened. Your mouth is going to be normal again. And as I lay there in the hospital bed, I began to let my tongue explore. I let it explore these new gaps that were now in my mouth. And I moved it over the edge of my broken tooth to a new hole that was now there. And I tasted blood. 
and the machine next to me is beeping and beeping and beeping. And I let my tongue go back to exploring this freed up space that was now in my mouth. And the remainder of the tooth that I'm pressing against feels jagged and sharp, but also more firm. And the machine beep, beep, beeps. And the doctors and nurses and my family talk, talk, talk. And I start to notice strange things about myself for the very first time. Like, I realize that my mind is singing do re mi from the sound of music. And that it always does that when there's too much chaos. And that I like that. And my tongue keeps pressing against my tooth. And in addition to tasting salt and blood, I also feel wetness. And in my eyes, I notice that I'm crying. And I realize that after I have a seizure, I inevitably cry. And as I lay here exploring and singing and crying, I have entered my else space. And in my else space, doctors and surgeons' words are no longer law. And blood and gaps are allowed to feel nice. And social constructions of disability do not apply. My worth is not linked to my production. My beauty is not determined by the scars on my face. Now, I can go beyond the horror of epilepsy. This space captures the beauty and the confusion, the terror that I feel in that moment right before I have a seizure, the complete tranquility of the post-seizure brain, which is a calm that I have never felt anywhere else the ecstasy and the excitement of losing control. To be clear, I'm not aiming to enter a space free of fear or negativity because the negatives exist. As I lay there in bed, discovering new gaps in my mouth, I'm unable to open my mouth to take a drink of water without spilling blood. And it hurts. In my L space, I hurt. I ache. I mourn. But in my L space, I am able to explore my epilepsy. It is not hidden. It is not shamed. And I am not scared of learning more. And I will not forget that it ever happened. I am sitting. So I want to invite you now to think of a time when somebody said to you, everything is going to be OK. Everything's going to be fine. Well, you're going to get better. This will be over soon. And somehow, these comforting words, these good intentions, maybe just didn't sit so well with you. We are not comfortable just sitting with otherness, with else. But what if we could? What if we could just sit in our else spaces? What if, instead of looking at my face, cringing, and telling me that I would forget it was ever broken. The surgeons and doctors and my family allowed my exploration of my disability and myself. What if they explored it with me? Because the fact is, no matter how hard they tried, despite the stitches and the medicines and the new teeth, those seizures are now a part of me. So instead of helping me to forget, why not facilitate a space of remembrance and radical acceptance. In your else space, you are creating a space of resistance for yourself. And you are resisting a dominant imposition of binaries. We do not have to be well or unwell, sick or healthy, pretty or ugly, productive or lazy. In our else spaces, we can thrive while being unwell. So I want to invite you now to think about your else. Pick up your pencil and write down the one thing that currently others or distances you from society. The thing that, when brought up or made evident, would make someone cringe and say, we're going to make you forget that this ever happened, or everything's going to be OK. This could be anything. It doesn't have to be a physical trauma like my seizures, although it can be. Maybe you might think about a difficult relationship that brings you a lot of guilt or shame. Maybe you struggle with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and feel that you are not on a conducive path to healing. 
Maybe your else surrounds your body image. Maybe your else is about how you've been affected during this pandemic. And as we start to see signs that we're coming out of it, you aren't so excited. And maybe that scares you. Your else might be that you are just not good enough. Whatever it is, go ahead and identify it. Write it down in as little or as many words as you'd like. What might it feel like to inhabit your own else space? This is to say, what would your else space look like if you didn't have to be okay about something? If you didn't have to get better? If you didn't need to heal? What might you begin to explore? And how would that then feel? How would it feel to allow yourself to simply sit with it? To sit in your else space? You might be thinking right now, well, sitting with my else face doesn't feel good. Sitting with images of your injured face on this screen isn't comfortable. And you're right. To conceptualize the else space, I turned to Gloria Anseldua's work, Borderlands. It's a text which describes physical and metaphorical borders. She explores the borders between Latinos and non-Latinos, men and women, queer people and non-queer people, and the very real U.S.-Mexico border. Anseldua describes these borderlands not as transitional, but as a distinct space of exploration. Anseldua writes about the borderlands. It's not a comfortable place to live in, this place of contradictions. Hatred, anger, and exploitation are the prominent features of this landscape. This L space, this borderland space, helps show the dissonance created from the dominant binary of healthy, unhealthy, well, unwell, good, bad, and most importantly, it reveals the missing space for the unwell body and mind in our society. I do not mean for you to be comfortable in your L space, but to explore an essential missing space of resistance, a space where you can thrive. So let's create that space together, this space of resistance, the L space. So now, I'd like for you to think about a time when you felt forced into a binary. For example, people frequently ask me, how long has it been since you've had a seizure? Or say to me some iteration of, well, you don't seem disabled. And in answering how long I've gone without having a tonic-clonic seizure, or how long I have been healthy by societal standards, by seeming not disabled, I feel forced into a binary of healthy, unhealthy. So I invite you to think of a time when you have felt a similar dissonance and to write your binary on either side of your else. By inhabiting your else space, by sitting with our else's and refusing to comply with these binaries that are imposed on us, we are helping to redefine these societal constructs of disabled and unwell. In my else space, I can sit with my epilepsy, all of it. I don't need to be cured or to be okay. My lip doesn't need to be stitched and I can explore my broken teeth, feeling the pain, the shame, the excitement of a seizure, the weird desire to laugh as it starts and the immediate impulse to cry when it ends. In my L space, I'm free to bleed, free to mourn, free to question, I am allowed to celebrate my body and its tricks. In my L space, I get to explore. Now take a minute to write about your L space in words or images. Represent your L space knowing that it is uniquely yours. What would it look like? What would it feel like? How would you thrive in your L space? How would you be unwell? What expectations would you no longer have to meet? And again, I'd like to ask you, what would it feel like if you didn't have to be okay about it? What would it feel like for you if you didn't need to heal? If you didn't need to get better? As you write, go ahead and let your else space encompass your binary and your else. You are creating an in-the-middle-of-it space, 
a space of resistance that is not meant to be transitional, but meant to be explored and sat with. You can find joy while you are sick, while you are mourning. You can be angry while you are scared, while you are ecstatic. Your mouth can be damaged and you can feel pleasure. You may be looking at your paper and the space that you're creating, and it may look ugly or scary. It may have scars. You may have scars. It may hurt. There is a reason that we want to quickly say, everything is okay. The L space is not a comfortable place. However, as we begin exploring these contradictions and resisting these binaries, remember that the L space is yours. It is uniquely yours. You do not have to forget about it. You do not have to hide it. In your L space, you can thrive while being unwell. Thank you.